This crash course, exponential technologies in real estate that will impact you and you and you sooner than you think. Please join in welcoming me to the stage, the Director of Marketing, Andrew Bizzle and Bethello. Well, I'll start by saying everything is changing. Everything. There are two forces moving in parallel currently. The first are people who are innovating at a pace far greater than has ever been before in humanity. And there are disruptors who are taking out models, making them obsolete, and starting new business models and new technologies that are going to disrupt all our lives. Now, I love this quote. We, as a company, designed for success in the 20th century, are doomed to destruction in the 21st. Why do I say that? There are 52% of Fortune 500 companies in the last 15 years that have disappeared. This guy, who's, uh, whose quote this is from, David Rose, is an archangel investor in New York. He's invested in about 100 startups. And what he said is that if we stick to our old ways, we are going to go downhill. But it's not really painting a dark story here. What I'm trying to do is enlighten you or what we're trying to do here is to be enlightened with a hopeful story. We are living in the most diverse, beautiful time known to mankind. Why do I say that? Because technology is enabling us to do great things for the betterment of mankind. Why so? Anyone know who this guy is? This is Gordon Moore. He pretty much set the law that talks about accelerating revenues and accelerating growth within the technology scene. What he says is that every two years, there will be a doubling of computing power, meaning a double in number of transistors on an integrated circuit chip. What does that mean? If we can do things at a far greater speed than we could every two years, we can become superhumans. It's challenging to think of it, right? But we can. Take a look at this graph. This covers 500 years from the printing press up until the car, the innovation of the car. That's 500 years. Moving upwards, we hit an exponential curve. And when does that happen? That happens when we start digitizing things, when the microprocessor was invented. Gordon Moore is the co-founder of Intel. And he said that as long as we keep up with the speed, and this is what he predicted and people laughed, we are going to reach a state of supremacy at some point where we can actually use technology for the betterment of mankind, dividing ro resources across the globe for humanity. Now, over here you can see in 1958, there were two transistors on a circuit board. Moving along, 1971, 2,300 transistors, 2018, 21 billion transistors on a circuit board. That's why you have everything in the back of your pocket in a smartphone. So let me just make this really simple in explaining what exponential is. If you look at things in a linear way, you take 30 steps, you get 30 meters ahead of yourself, yeah? If one step is a meter. If you take 30 exponential steps, that changes completely. That's 26 times around the globe. Now, if technology is in being enhanced at such a speed, can you only imagine what we can do with it? So the development that's going to take place in the next 200 years is going to be far more than anything that happened in the last 20,000. Anyone know about the Kodak story? I love to share this story to talk about digital disruption. Kodak, in 1996, had a market cap of $28 billion. They had 140,000 employees. Kodak was at the head of their game. They were ahead of innovation. 
They were known for helping people preserve memories. What they then forgot, they forgot, even though they were harnessing an innovation hub within their own company, they forgot at what speed it would hit them. The first person who invented a digital camera was actually based in Kodak, but they did not bring it to market soon enough. And that's why in 2012, they went bankrupt, they lost employees, they were down at 17,000 employees. And then in 2012, we had Instagram come out, Facebook bought them at 1 billion, 13 employees. And September 2018, what are they worth? Any guesses? Citigroup valuation said that it was less than 50 billion that they were worth but they are currently at 100 billion in valuation. That's crazy, right? This is exponential technology. Everyone remembers this? I have a box of this under my bed currently. I love these, um, but I do have that. I have my Apple playlist at the back of my pocket, and I carry this music everywhere I go. What's that worth? Apple Music as a service is worth 10 billion. It has 36 million paid subscriptions. We have dematerialization, where you have hotels trying to come up with promotional offers, such as Marriott, join to earn 2,000 bonus points. They have assets that they store with them, hotel rooms that they are trying to rent out, and then you get Airbnb come in. Airbnb is at 38 billion currently, and it has 5 million lodging options. I use Airbnb when I travel to Europe every time. We are living in a time where the law of accelerating returns is upon us. We need to be aware of it. Do we go ahead with the ride or we wait to be disrupted? We are in the time of the fourth industrial revolution. It is a very early stage. We are seeing it. We are picking up bits and pieces, but we are not acting fully. Not yet because some of us are a little bit blinded by how quickly this could pick up and creep up on our back. I'm going to start by talking a little bit about robotics and 3D printing and construction, show you some examples. So this is really to touch base and give you the broader perspective. I'm not going to get into any technicalities of this, but I just want you to see the impact it could poss possibly have within the construction scene and within the real estate industry and really within the world. So what is a robot? Anything that's programmable and moves, yeah? And what is 3D printing? 3D printing is a robot that takes blueprints of something and then prints out that thing made of a specific material. Now I'm going to ask you, what if you could download your home and print it in 24 hours at half the cost? of really anything that you would pay to build a house now, would you do it? How many hands? How many people would live in a 3D printed house? This home is in Austin, Texas, $10,000 to build it in two days. It's really initial, initial stages of this technology because they haven't found the right the right material that's sustainable enough for, you know, hazardous weather, the extreme cold, heated climates, insulation, all of these things. But at this stage, they're already experimenting. And guess who's picking up right behind them? China, of course, and the UAE. The Future Foundation has its plans as well in 3D printing. So when I think about 3D printing, I think bigger. What if humanity could actually have access to housing at such a cheap cost. All of, here, all of us here are pretty wealthy. I mean, I would say we're not, we're not poor, we're not living below our means. Imagine if everyone was to crowdfund a home in a developing country. It's amazing what this technology can do. In China, obviously, they, they test and they experiment with efficiency. In China, they have, a mini, they, they have a building called Mini Sky City, which is 57 stories high, blocks of 3D printed manufacturing units that are piled on top of each other. And it is actually there right now for use and being tested in terms of durability. Which is pretty neat. 
So the Dubai Future Foundation, if you go on their website, they do have a strategy for 2030 to become the 3D printing hub. Um, it would be cool to read about that, to know what the city is trying to do to harness this kind of technology. The future, the, the next thing I really want to talk about is the future of AR and AI. AR is augmented reality, AI is uh, artificial intelligence, all the buzzwords that you could have possibly heard today, I'm sure, um, and robotics, and how that ties into property management services and concierge. So, what you're going to see right now is pretty much an eye-opener to how the service industry, when it comes to maintenance of properties, can change. We need some volume, guys. It actually happened with this elevator before. He already has all the information right there without having to look for it. It saves a lot of time and a lot of stress and effort. gets information on his virtual desktop about the task orders you have to carry out. The latest safety alerts for that elevator. He pulls on a 3D a replication of that part, pulls it out in an exploded view, and can actually see which part is making the problem. A major advantage of the HoloLens, of course, is that we are hands-free, and we never had that experience and the capability before. In the past, the technician needed both of his hands to operate the laptop, and now he just has his HoloLens on. One of the most important capabilities we see with HoloLens is that we can trigger a remote call to a subject matter expert. Call Heather. Hey Jeff, how are you doing? I'm uh, replacing a doorboard out here, but I kind of want you to check a couple things out. Okay, let me take a look. The JP3 is in the right position. Can you imagine when, you're, when you have property maintenance com companies using the Microsoft Hologen lens to actually help training all their staff to do a better job? That's, that's pretty awesome. They're actually going to be launching the second version of that this year, and they're testing it in Sweden and Finland. The next is this guy. Has anyone ever been served by a robot? So I was just in San Francisco, and uh, this guy brought water to my room. And I was thinking, you know, he was the cutest thing ever. He actually had a conversation with me. But I was just thinking, I mean, if that's the case right now, and they're testing these things, it's just a matter of time before the service industry gets automated, right? Pretty cool. I would say, um, I would suggest you, you look this guy up on YouTube for the purpose of time. I didn't play a video. Um, but there are butler robots now. So hotel management companies, service departments, the things you could do. Future of AI is something that's actually mind-boggling to sum up in a 15-minute talk or in the next two minutes that I've got to cover it. But I'm going to try and touch on it. The thing I want you to, to realize is the disruption doesn't only come from within the industry. It comes from all over. So the things that you're going to see are disruption coming from the automotive industry, disruption coming from healthcare segment, and it's all going to impact you as an ecosystem. Why do I say that? I'll get into it in a while, but let's touch on AI. AI, in a nutshell, as uh, explained by someone I really admire, he is a professor in Stanford, the previous uh, CTO of Baidu, and he ran the innovation lab at Google for Google Brain. His name is Andrew Ning. And he defines it as the new electricity. When electricity came out, we didn't realize what it could do for our lives, and now we can't live without it. Similarly, AI is going to be so embedded in our day-to-day -day lives, we're not going to even realize it in a matter of 10 years. To really explain AI or artificial intelligence, you look at two points. You look, look at an input point and an output point. Everything, the foundation of AI, is based on the volume of data that is fed into a system. The more data you have, the more accurate the output of a particular uh, task. So let's take a few examples. The first one, scan your face, tell you if it's you. Everyone's seen it pop up on Facebook where you, know, you get these little creepy notifications, is that you, is that your friend? That's scanning your face and trying to figure out if that's you. Then you've got loan application softwares. They take in your information. They see if you can actually be viable to receive a loan. 
based on certain criteria without going through a human interaction. The third thing is kind of already in the market. Anyone in marketing knows that Google AdWords, for example, they take in the ad, they take in user details, so the ads that you see on Google, and then they decide how much that is going to be for a click. So a marketer or an advertiser will bid on certain things, and then they will know through the AI that's running Google AdWords how much that click is going to be running on an AI platform. Another thing is speech recognition. Take in speech, output text transcripts. And then the last thing is self-driving cars, which I find absolutely fascinating. Has anyone been in a self-driving car? Does anyone want to be in a self-driving car? <laughs> um, I think we have some, uh, some, some people who are willing to experiment in the crowd. That's cool. All right, I'm going to play this video. I want you to see what happened when there was a family sitting in a self-driving car and listen to the beep. Nee, wacht even, wacht even. Wacht even tot we kijken wat er achter ons gebeurt. Eerst kijken wat er achter ons gebeurt. Blijf zitten, rustig blijf zitten. Eerst maar eens even kijken wat er gebeurt. Niks doen, niks doen, niet uitgaan alsjeblieft. Kom, nou even kijken. There's a lot of talk about whether AI in self-driving cars can actually be accurate enough to protect you, right? And as time goes on and more data is fed into these machine learning algorithms, it's going to become more accurate. But this is one example, right? I'm going to replay that video, and I'm going to stop the video at when the beep comes on. And that's going to tell you when the car detected a possible accident outcome. That's crazy. Like, as a human being, I don't think you'd have picked that up, right? Like, the cars haven't even moved close together. But because this, this network of cars have been trained for a certain period of time, they can pick up on inertia. They can pick up on when a possible collision can come through. Now, that's pretty cool. The reason I share that is because we all worry about the accuracy of AI. And, you know, there's one thing that Elon Musk said. I love this quote. He said, we believe that Tesla, other companies making electric cars in the world would, be, would all benefit from a commonplace, a rapidly evolving techno technology platform. What he's saying is he's open sourcing technology development. And how is that going to impact real estate? That's what you're all worried about, right? Well, I'll tell you. Have a look at this, and I want you to think about it. I'm not going to tell you. This is all for all of us to try and figure out over time, but there will be knock-on effects. So this is Volvo. Volvo is experimenting with driverless cars, and hear what they have to say about cities and how it's going to change cities. We need to discuss together how we would like our future cities to be. Yeah, if you look at a city, it's really designed around communication. That's the whole idea of a city. A million people living in the same place, but you need to communicate, you need to move around. It used to be by feet, by ship, by horse and carriage, and now it's by car. But of course, you also know how it is in, in the cities with all the congestion, all the parked cars. If you had driverless cars which could move around, did not need to park, they can be silent because they are electrical, it could really change the way a city looks like. So if cities change, how will the real estate industry change? If cars are going to be used differently, how is it going to change not only the building and construction designs, but the actual movement within a city? Have a think about that, and I'd love to talk about it and hear your ideas, because it really, it really intrigues me. The next bit is on uh, the future of blockchain on the world. And I'm not, going to t I'm not going to get into details about it, because uh, there is someone from Divisal who's going to be sitting on a panel not uh, long from now as well who will get into details. But really, just to touch on it, I'm sure you've heard a lot about it over the course of the day. What blockchain is, is it's really providing an option for human beings not to doubt. What do I mean? When you actually go 
you know, put your money somewhere, you sign a, a contract, you submit it, you go to the bank, you go to a government institution, you go to a valuation company, you have to build trust with those brands. What blockchain does is it just an open ledger system. What does that mean? That means that every entity is really a node. It has its own data, but it openly shares this data. So if something changes, if I go in and I want to, let's say, create fraud, manipulate the system, I make a change, let's say, as an individual, every single node and every single block within the system is going to have to be rewritten. What does this mean? This actually increases security and increases the flow of transactions. So to sum it up, this is from the Gartner report. They're expecting by 2030, 13, 13.1 trillion worth of blockchain value add to come through just from this technology. That's massive. And this is just the start. We haven't even implemented it within the region. Just imagine what it could do for us. But who's not happy about it? It's the middleman, right? Because they're the ones who get removed, but we can also be innovative about what we do. The next video is actually about changing economic models from the world. We're going to have to skip the video because we've got to move on. If you can cut All to right. your concluding remarks, thank you. Let's play the video and then I'll cut it off. Thank yeah? you. Yeah, cool. This video is really important because I feel that people need to understand how economic models need to shift. And the World Economic Forum is already talking about it at scale. We need a different economic model. By that, I don't mean capitalism versus communism. What I'm talking about is a shift in the system along the lines of the two big changes that happened in the 20th century, Keynesianism, with a much greater focus on health and education and the role of government working with business, and then a reaction against that in late century to neoliberalism, where the focus was on free markets, freedom of the individual, and getting governments out of the way. We need a shift to a new system that will allow us to meet the basic needs of every human on the planet, that will live within planetary means, that will be fairer, and that will be focused as its key goal, not on growth per se, but on maximizing human well-being. And history tells us that a value shift is triggered by creation of a new story about how we want And I'm going to close with this slide, the third takeaway which is there needs to be a shift in the economic model that we choose. There needs to be a shift in consciousness. And to be honest, people are not, businesses are not thinking just about growth. They're thinking about how they can ben benefit humanity as a whole. Thank you. Anne is very keen to continue the conversation as well.